I'm Elliot Quadert, a professor here in the astronomy and physics departments and current chair of the astronomy department. So this is our annual distinguished astronomy lecture where we bring in uh, an eminent scientist from another institution, give a public talk tonight, and then Fiona will be here tomorrow meeting with many of us and giving a science talk later in the afternoon. So tonight's speaker is Fiona Harrison from Caltech. She's the Benjamin Rosen Professor of Physics and Astronomy, and she's also the Chair of the Physics, Math, and Astronomy Division at Caltech. So the fact that she's called Chair and I'm called Chair might make you think those are similarly important jobs, but they're not. <laughs> um, chair at, at Caltech is really more equivalent to Dean, so Francis Hellman's position. That's a job that has far more power and responsibility and money than I do. Uh, which, frankly, I'm grateful for. Um, so Fiona was an undergraduate at Dartmouth and then actually did her PhD work here at UC Berkeley. Uh, she got her PhD in physics here in 1993. She worked uh, significantly at the Space Sciences Lab. So for those of you who don't know that, that's a lab up the hill that really specializes in building hardware for NASA telescopes. Uh, and in actually operating uh, telescopes. So it's an operation center and actually develops the hardware for a number of NASA telescopes. There are very few universities in the world that have the capability to actually train graduate students in hardware development for major NASA projects. Uh, Berkeley is one of them. Caltech with uh, JPL there is also one of them. In fact, the work that Fiona did for her PhD at Berkeley was in developing detectors, so the way you actually detect X-rays and gamma rays, uh, that went into the telescope that she'll tell us a lot about today. And that is a lot harder than it seems. If you imagine going to the dentist, right, you get an X-ray of your skull, that shows you the difficulty of actually detecting X-rays. They pass readily through our body. But for astronomy, we want to actually gather them up, collect them, and use them to observe the universe. And that's one of the things that Fiona specializes in. So after uh, completing her PhD at Berkeley, she was a postdoc at Caltech before she joined the faculty there, where she's been ever since. Uh, she's an expert on uh, astronomical explosions of various kinds, gamma ray bursts, flashes of gamma rays, uh, gas spiraling into black holes, stellar explosions of various kinds. Uh, and as I said, a lot of her career has been based uh, not only in doing observational astronomy, but in actually building the tools um, that enable us to launch satellites into space and do astronomical observations. So I'm actually a theoretical astrophysicist, so I don't know anything about telescopes. And I have to tell you that of everybody in the field, uh, the people that I have the most respect for are the people who can actually design, build, uh, and function uh, telescopes. That's an extraordinary skill, and that's really what drives our field forward, is those advances in instrumentation. So uh, Fiona's work on developing X-ray and gamma ray telescopes uh, has culminated thus far in the launch of the New Star satellite in 2012. Uh, and this is what will be uh, a major theme of her talk tonight. That telescope has given us an entirely new view of the sky uh, at X-ray wavelengths. So, that in particular gives us information about phenomena that are very hot, very dense, conditions that are quite a bit more extreme than we find typically here on Earth or in the solar system. So the theme of the talk will be things like neutron stars, black holes, stellar explosions, exciting phenomena like that. Uh, for both the science that she's done with X-ray facilities and for her development of the hardware for those facilities. Fiona's received a number of prizes and recognition. I'd like to particularly highlight the Bruno Rossi Prize, which is the highest honor of the High Energy Astrophysics Division of the American Astronomical Society, and her election in the National Academy of Sciences, which is the preeminent uh, intellectual institution for scientists in the United States.
So in addition to everything else she's doing, um, running the New Star Telescope, doing science with it, PIing a new telescope to look at colliding neutron stars, uh, Fiona is also the co-chair of the 2020 Astronomy Decadal Survey in Astronomy. So every 10 years, the astronomy community gets together uh, and tries to make priorities for what the most important science to do and the most important telescopes to build are for the following decade. And that's an enormous undertaking that takes uh, almost two years to do. It requires gathering the herd of cats that is the thousands of professional astronomers in the United States. And I think it's really a testament to the esteem that the entire astronomical community has for Fiona, for her vision for the field and for accomplishments to date, that she was asked to lead this year's version of that survey. So we're really honored to have her here tonight. So. Well, thank you for that introduction. <clears throat> it's great to be back. Uh, I come back here relatively frequently. I can't help but you know go over for coffee on Durant Street. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm going to tell you today about the New Star mission. This is what I've spent most of my career on, first developing the technologies, getting NASA to agree to uh, fund it and launch it. And so New Star is the very first orbiting telescope that can actually focus high energy x-rays. So it views the universe uh, in a completely different way, making images that are hundreds of times deeper, a uh, hundred times crisper than any previous instrument that we've had uh, working in this part of the spectrum. Uh, New Star is also a small explorer mission. This is the smallest standalone astrophysics platform that NASA has. And people often ask, how small is small? It was $160 million for everything, including the launch and science. And that sounds like a lot of money. But when you put something in space, it's actually not. Um, so New Star, as Elliot said, was launched in 2012. And what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit about the mission itself. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of science highlights uh, from the mission so far, measurements of the spin of black holes, and the radioactive debris from exploded stars. Uh, so New Star, as Elliot said, is studying some of the hottest, densest, most energetic regions in the, in the universe. So I, I want to start with the big picture and kind of reflect a little bit on my, the time since I was a graduate student here, which was 25 years ago when I got my PhD. And when I think about this, we really do live in a golden age of astronomy. In the last 25 years, our view of the universe has completely changed. When I was in graduate school, we were arguing about the age of the universe to a factor of two. Now we're arguing about the second decimal place, 13.77 uh, billion years old. And uh, the other thing that was completely unknown when I was in graduate school was that the evolution of structures in the universe is shaped by something called dark matter. And if you look at this picture over here on the left, um, it shows you how uh, from the primordial soup of hydrogen and helium, uh, galaxies uh, condensed and formed and evolved, shaped by the gravity of something called dark matter that we have no idea what it is. Um, and how will the universe end? Well, th its fate is determined uh, by something called dark energy, also newly discovered since I was a graduate student. So on the right, what this pie chart shows you is just a few percent of the universe that we study in light and in x-rays and the kind of telescopes uh, that we've had. Uh, and I want to point out that researchers here at Berkeley and at LBNL played fundamental roles in both uh, understanding uh, the age of the universe, dark matter, and dark energy. 
So how did our view, our understanding of the universe change so fundamentally in such a short time? I mean, it's just less than a generation, right? So it was through technological advances uh, combined with the access to space that has changed things and changed our ability to view the sky in uh, fundamental ways. So uh, it's our ability to study the universe in microwaves. So this is the same radiation when you heat your cup of coffee in the morning in your microwave oven, same radiation. That enables to look uh, for us to look all the way back to just 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, by looking at infrared, that's the same radiation that we experience as heat, uh, we're able to study uh, first light in the universe, so when stars and galaxies were beginning to, to form. Uh, and then, of course, in the optical, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, has given us an unprecedented view of galaxies and how they evolved. So uh, combined, it's this ability to study the universe in so many ways that's new. So I'll remind you that Hubble uh, was launched in 1990 and was fixed so that it really achieved its sensitivity in 1993. That's about when I graduated. Uh, this is all happened in the last 25 years. So what do microwaves, infrared radiation, uh, and optical light all have in common? Well, it's all the same fundamental physical phenomenon, which is something that never ceases to amaze me when I think about it. Uh, what's different between them, so this is the oscillation of electric and magnetic waves, and the thing that are, that's different between these kinds of radiation is just the distance between the peaks. So if you think of an analogy of waves on the ocean, right, and you think of the distance between crests of the waves, right, uh, for uh, infrared radiation, this distance is about the width of a human hair. Uh, and for radio waves, same phenomenon, it's the size of a building. Uh, for ultraviolet, it's about, you know, it's the size of a molecule. And for x-rays, which is what I'm going to focus most of the rest of my talk on, uh, it's about the size of an atom. And so uh, I want to also point out one other important thing, which is if you look at this temperature scale here on the bottom of the, of the graph, right, you can see that the temperature in degrees Celsius there. Um, and the shorter the wavelength of the radiation, the hotter the material is that's emitting it. So again, when we study x-rays, we're studying objects that are very hot, uh, millions of degrees. And so when you have telescopes, if you want to observe the entire universe, and all the matter in it, uh, all the visible matter in it, at all temperatures, you really need to go from radio waves all the way to x-rays and gamma rays. So I mentioned that access to space is a key, and I want to explain why that is. So now, this is a little confusing because the scale is inverted from the last graph that I showed you. I couldn't find one where it was the other way around. So here, gamma rays is on the left and radio waves is on the right. But anyway, so flip your head. And what this shows you is the altitude above sea level and the little black lines show you how far radiation of a given uh, wavelength or type can penetrate. And you can see, really, from the ground, we have this tiny window in the visible. Right? That's why our eyes evolved to see visible light, where radiation can reach the ground, and then again in the radio. But to cover the entire spectrum, we really need access to space. All right, so now you know that x-rays are just another kind of light, so they don't have magical cleansing properties. Uh, and 
The other thing I'll say about them is this guy can't detect them with those glasses, okay? <laughs> you need very sophisticated types of mirrors and detectors, and I've spent, as Elliot told you, significant time uh, trying to help develop uh, these technologies. All right, so here's another view of the electromagnetic spectrum going from infrared on the left to gamma rays on the right. And this highlights the X-ray part of the spectrum, okay? And uh, we've had very powerful observatories that have viewed the heavens in the low energy, all right, or longer wavelength part of the X-ray spectrum. This is NASA's Chandra mission and ESA's XMM-Newton mission. New Star is the first uh, telescope, as I said, that can truly focus at, uh, in the higher energy part of the X-ray spectrum. And uh, if you look, there's, you'll notice there's two scales. I don't want you to worry about the units, okay? If you actually studied physics, you know that we can think of light as having both a wavelength and an energy. But don't worry about the units. We usually, in the X-ray uh, astronomy community, we use the top units, all right? But all I want you to remember is the number 10, okay? Because 10 in units you don't have to worry about is the traditional dividing line between what I will call low energy X-rays and high energy X-rays. In other words, the region where we've had in, uh, before New Star very uh, sophisticated telescopes, New Star is the first telescope to focus and be sensitive above 10, okay? And so this has given us a whole new view of the universe. Now, I, I do want to point out here that we have had instruments that have viewed the heavens in high energy X-rays, all right? But they were very crude based on kind of pinhole cameras, right? And if you've ever use a pinhole camera, you know you use it to look at the sun or very bright things because it's, it's inherently not very sensitive. That's what we had before. Okay, so I'm going to use an analogy here to try to explain what you get by adding high energy x-rays to our palette of colors uh, with which we view the universe. So visible light is made of colors and so is X-ray light. So low energy X-rays correspond in this analogy to red, yellow, and green light, where the high energy X-rays correspond to blue, indigo, and violet, all right? So you can think of New Star as adding these new colors to the X-ray window. And this is a visible light image of a galaxy, beautiful, called the antenna, and on the left, this is the image in black and white. If you make the image in red and yellow, what you're seeing is you're seeing the cooler, dusty regions uh, of the galaxy, right? And then on the right, if you add blue light, what you're seeing is where hot young stars are forming and blowing energy out into the galaxy. And so when you look in different colors and add them all together, again, what you're seeing is regions with different physical properties, different temperatures. And uh, so it's by bringing uh, the full range of colors that uh, we get the, this rich view of the universe. Okay, so using the same color or energy, all right, so color corresponds to energy, of x-rays that your doctor and dentist use to image your teeth and bones, this is the same energy that New Star is using to observe these hot, dense regions of the universe. And uh, again, because high energy x-rays are very penetrating, that's why they're used for medical x-rays, because they penetrate through your skin and image, uh, but are stopped by your bones. Uh, they also penetrate through dust and gas and illuminate objects that are otherwise hidden from view. So this is unlike the lower energy X-rays. So these are some images of real, real images of astronomical objects where the red 
uh, and green are low energy X-rays, and the blue is what's been added by New Star. So you can see illuminating uh, and measuring temperatures and uh, in the hot regions here, you can see of our sun, the hottest regions are uh, in these flares. So being able to focus these high energy, ener energy X-rays took a lot of technology development. Both new kinds of X-ray lenses or optics and new kinds of detectors. And this is, uh, you know, myself and my collaborators uh, spent more than a decade uh, developing. So in this um, photo, you can see the X-ray detectors that Elliot referred to. These I started working on when I was here at Berkeley. Uh, and then when we built them, we actually collaborated with people at Space Sciences Lab here. These are kind of like the uh, detector in your, the digital detector in your cell phone, only they have to be made out of special material that can actually stop uh, the x-rays. Uh, x-ray mirrors look very different than mirrors in the optical, right? So we developed uh, those also for the New Star mission. And as Elliot said, we built a lot of the hardware in my labs at Caltech and also up the hill, go up Centennial Drive to the top at Space Sciences Lab, uh, giving the opportunity uh, for students and postdocs to actually get their hands on the hardware. That's one of the great things about these uh, smaller uh, NASA missions. So it was about 15 years from the first serious technology uh, development to launch. It was about four years to actually build the mission. So this picture here shows you the New Star spacecraft. Right? That was all put together uh, out in Dulles, Virginia. And then drip, we drove it across the country to Vandenberg, where we put it in uh, what's the rocket, what's called the shroud. So you can see that on the right. Then it's a very unusual kind of launch. Because New Star is a small mission, you need an inexpensive, inexpensive launch vehicle. So the rocket was actually mounted under the belly of an L-1011 aircraft. And what I want to point out here, because this will be important in a minute, is that this right here, all, the whole telescope has to fit in that region. Okay, So think about that relative to the length of this L-1011. Some of you may remember L-1011s, right? Those were used, what, 40 years ago or something. Anyway, so the, the uh, airplane took off from Vandenberg and flew to Kwajalein in the South Pacific, not for the palm trees, but there's a reason you want to go around the equator that I won't go into, uh, and uh, launched. And it's a very interesting kind of launch. I want to show you a video of how it works. This is not actually the New Star launch, because New Star launched at night, so you couldn't see anything. But this is another launch. Same kind of uh, launch vehicle called a Pegasus. So the, what the aircraft does is it takes off and it gets to like 35,000 feet or something. And then the rocket drops for five seconds, ignites, and actually launches in front of the aircraft. Okay. So this happened June 13th of 2012 for New Star. And then the rocket goes into an orbit. It basically goes into free fall around the Earth. So it goes around the whole Earth every 90 minutes at an altitude of about uh, 600 kilometers. So as it turns out, this com the company that builds this, it used to be called Orbital Sciences. And the CEO is a personal friend of mine. And uh, it was actually the research advisor for his daughter when she was a high school student. <laughs> uh, so he said, you know what, I'm going to give you this great opportunity. We rarely allow scientists to do this, but we'll let you ride in the plane. And I thought, great. Take off with a ton of solid explosive under <laughs> me. So I, I didn't uh, ride in the plane. So in fact, I was here at Berkeley, up on the hill for the launch, uh, where you could actually, what, I mean, what's important? So New Start launched at night. 
Uh, but what's important is after you launch, right, it's nail-biting minutes, right, to see whether you go up or down, right? And I wasn't particularly worried about this because I, I figured, yeah, it's going to go up or down and there's nothing I can do about it, all right? But I wanted to see the, all the telemetry that comes afterwards. And you can see that's an infrared. Remember I said warm things are visible in the infrared? Well, the rocket was warm, and so you could have an infrared camera where we could... Uh, see it. So, in fact, it went up, which was good, and is got into a 600 kilometer orbit uh, around the Earth. And so, what uh, my research group at Caltech saw this is the actual New Star launch. So, that's all you know. Okay, so that's all I would have seen. What I was worried about was something that I did have more to do with, and that's what had to happen. Uh, it happened about nine days after launch. Okay, so now if you remember, I said, remember how short that rocket shroud is compared to the length of the airplane? And if you think back to that picture I showed you of the Chandra X-ray telescope and the XMM telescope and the New Star telescope, they're all really long, right? They're about 10 meters, 33 feet, the length of a school bus, okay? Because that X-ray optics, that's the way they work. You have to have a long distance between the optic and, and the detector. So how does that happen? Well, we sent a command to the instrument, and uh, when that command was received, what happened is a tinker toy-like structure of about 100,000 piece parts started to unfold, clicking into place one piece at a time, all right? So this took a total of 24 minutes. So the Mars guys brag about their seven minutes of terror, right? This was 24 minutes of terror because I actually knew that when we tried this on the ground the first time it didn't work and we never fully deployed it all assembled, but it worked perfectly. And in fact, locked into place, and uh, New Star's two X-ray telescopes, there's two of them pointing at the same direction. We just add the images, it's just to get, uh, collect more X-rays. So I wanna show you in a very qualitative way the advance that New Star has made uh, in our ability to view the high energy X-ray universe. Remember I told you that we've had these kind of crude pinhole camera-like telescopes in the high energy X-ray band? This is an image from one of them, which is about four times the diameter of the sun in area of the sky by two times the diameter of the sun, okay? But it's centered on a very special place, which is the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy, where there resides a a few million solar mass black hole, all right? And this shows you that with these pinhole camera sources, these, these big blobs, those are big just because the resolution the bl is very blurry. It's a very blurry telescope that can only see a very few of the brightest objects. If we take one pixel in this image and blow it up, that's the field of view of New Star. And you can see all of this detail that we can see for the first time, all right? And one of our first discoveries, in fact, is you notice this haze, uh, blue haze, around the center uh, uh, of the supermassive black hole in our galaxy. So it turns out that this, this had never been seen before, and what it is, it's a swarm of dead remnants of stars creating this haze, and it, Again, it had never been seen before. And I'm not gonna tell you too much about how we think they got there, but we do take public outreach very seriously on New Star. So we had a press release about this result. <laughs> and it's always interesting to see how the press picks these things up. Uh, I particularly like uh, the zombie stars aspect of this. Uh, Anyway, so now let's talk about, specifically I'm gonna go into the science of two of the results, hopefully two uh, if I have the time. The first is how 
New Star has been able to make the first unambiguous measurement of this, what's called the spin of supermassive black holes uh, in the centers of galaxies. So first, let me tell you a little bit about black holes. What's a black hole? Well, black, a black hole is a rip or a tear in the fabric of space-time that happens when you get enough matter and you squish it into a small enough volume, it then collapses to uh, what physicists refer to as a singularity. And there's a region around the black hole where not even light uh, can escape. And so these black holes are actually a prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. They're not predicted by classical gravity. And Einstein himself actually thought the solution was an oddity and actually not really corresponding to real physical objects. But now we know, in fact, from many observations, including the discovery of gravitational waves, observations in the electromagnetic spectrum, that black holes uh, do exist. And this is actually not a real image of a black hole. This is just a simulation, OK? Because if you wanted to see in the optical this event horizon or region from which light can't escape, you'd have to have a telescope with incredibly good resolution, something that we don't have now and really can't uh, envision having. Now, you may have seen the press release of the image of the black hole. That was not in the optical. That was in the radio. I won't talk too much about it. I'll mention it uh, in a minute. But at any rate, um, all sorts of weird things happen around black holes. They bend light all right, because of gravity. Again, a prediction of general relativity. Uh, but besides mass, all right, which determines the size of this, what's called horizon, all right, uh, black holes have spin. And they acquire spin because if they, and the object that forms them, let's imagine it's a very massive star, okay, that collapses, for example. If that star is spinning, then you know, like the figure space, skater, when he brings in his arms, he spins more and more rapidly as it collapses. It spins more rapidly. And then when it collapses to a singularity, it acquires this thing called spin. And this is something that New Star uh, was able to measure. All right, so if no light can escape, how do we actually, quote unquote, see black holes? Well, black holes don't live in isolation for the most part. They live in galaxies that are full of dust and gas. And in some instances, there's enough dust and gas and conditions are right that just the gravity of the black hole attracts this matter. And as it falls in, when it gets close, it organizes itself into a disk, all right? And friction in the disk turns the gravitational energy into heat. And as it gets closer and closer, it gets hotter and hotter, and it radiates. And in these regions, particles get boosted very close to the speed of light. And all of these processes emit x-rays. And so it's through this matter falling on and uh, lighting up and emitting high-energy radiation that enables us to find these uh, massive black holes in the centers. Uh, so the black holes in the centers of galaxies are millions of, to billions of time, times the mass of the sun, right? They're quite common in the center of, of galaxies. But in a fraction of cases, this process is going on that lights them up. And we can find them in the x-rays. Now, I just want to show this image, because you may be confused by what I said. You said, well, you told me you couldn't image the event horizon of a black hole. But you probably saw this, because it was not only the most downloaded astronomical image ever, I'm told it was the most downloaded image from the web period ever, which is kind of an interesting thing. But this was made with a radio telescope showing this a region which is related to the event horizon of a black hole. That's very, very cool, but it's only been done once for one object. For the most part, we have to rely I'm looking at the radiation from these uh, 
disks of matter as it spirals in to the black hole. So this is an artist's conception of what goes on uh, very close to the black hole. So you see this disk of material that's spiraling on. And I told you there were regions where particles get boosted to high energies. Right? That, these regions here uh, emit x-rays. And uh, if we can use those x-rays emitted from this region to somehow tell us about the nature of this disk of material, we can determine the black hole spin. All right? And how the, I'm going to explain how this happens. Or right? if you don't completely follow it, that's OK. You'll get to the punchline. But basically, the way it works is this is like a flashlight. It shines down and reflects x-rays off this material. And by looking at the x-ray light, that is reflected off of this material, we can tell how close this disk of material comes to the black hole. All right? And how close it can come. All right? So it turns out, again, if you sort of took physics one or two, you know that in classical gravity, you can have a particle orbiting a body at any radius in a stable orbit. Right? But around a black hole, where general relativity is important, there's a minimum stable radius. And that depends on how fast the black hole is spinning. So if it's not spinning at all, uh, it can't come all the way close. It can't come as close to the back black hole as if the black hole spin is in the same sense as the material is uh, orbiting as it falls on. Okay? And so it's this that we're trying to measure. And you can do this with x-rays. Basically, what I'm showing here is the brightness of x-rays as a function of the color or energy, where this is blue or this is red. Here. Remember, I said to remember the number 10 as the dividing line between low energy and high energy x-rays. Okay? So you can see the shape of this uh, intensity of colors all the way from red to blue to very blue is very different uh, if this uh, material comes all the way close to the black hole. And this has to do with effects I won't go into uh, related to <clears throat> the distortions, uh, the velocity with which the material rotates and distortions do uh, to general relativity. So it's this measurement that we use to measure the spin. Now, if you're thinking, you're thinking, well, wait a minute. You told me that Chandra and XMM and these telescopes that we've had for years measure the spectrum up to 10, right? So how come you can't just use that? Okay. Well, it turns out there's a confounding factor that there's lots of dust and gas around these black holes. I already told you that. That's you know, what actually forms this disk of material. And if the x-rays have to travel through dust and gas, it can change the way that its intensity of colors looks and make it look really exactly like the gravitational distortion, the material coming very close. So people, for a long time, argued about, you know, is this a spinning black hole or is it just dust and gas? You know, and this was a lot of uncivil conversation at conferences for many years. Uh, about whether we were really seeing the black hole spin. But when you add the blue colors, or the new star colors, then the case where the black hole is spinning, OK, here, that shape, just focus on the shape, looks very different than if you just have a lot of dust and gas obscuring it. right? So it's this difference, suddenly, that enables us to do this. And so, this was one of the first observations that New Star made. We decided to look at a particular black hole in a galaxy called NGC 1365, by the way. All right, it's about a two billion, um, uh, million solar mass black hole. And uh, we decided to use XMM Newton, OK, look at the red colors at the same time uh, with New Star. And actually, 
This is known to be a very dusty galaxy, and what we actually wanted to look at was clouds of dust and gas. We thought, won't that be cool? We'll see this dust and gas moving around, okay. And so one of the first conferences I went to after launch, um, the, my collaborator, Guido, who was looking at the uh, XMM data, and I decided to meet at the bar before the conference, okay. And he said, okay, this is what I have. So here's the blue points from XMM, the red colors. And again, this is brightness or intensity as a function of the color of X-rays. If you don't quite understand what that means, don't worry. Again, you'll still understand the point, which is that this is a model in green where the black hole is spinning. It's a very high spin. And this is one where there's just a lot of dust and gas. And he said, well, they can't really tell the difference. And my student had been analyzing the new star data, and I pulled it out and sort of laid them on top of each other. And there's the new star data. Okay. So clearly indicating that this black hole is spinning actually quite close to the fastest rate that's allowed before it would uh, essentially fly apart. We call this maximally spinning black hole. So this was pretty cool and convinced 90% or maybe 99% of the community. All right. And uh, so we had a big press release because you want to get your results out to the public about this. And it was a great press release, but afterwards a bunch of reporters called me up and they said, well, you didn't say exactly how fast, like in miles per hour, this black hole is spinning. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, you can't really paint an X on the, you know, they have, there's no fiducial mark on a black hole. You know, I'm trying to explain this in an understandable way. So you can't really watch how fast a mark is going around. And it's not really a right way to think about it. And they said, well, you have to give me some speed, like, you know, okay, so how fast is it rotating in rotations per second? I said, well, you can't really point an, paint an X on a black hole. So then I thought, oh, well, maybe here's a way. I said, well, look, okay, so spinning black holes, one thing that they do, which is one reason why the, this material can come closer, is they drag, they literally drag space and time around with them. Okay, so I said, okay, so if I'm an observer near the black hole, I would have to rotate 15 times per minute as viewed by an observer at infinity just to stand still. I said, well, that doesn't sound very fast. So then I finally came up with the following, okay, with the mass of this black hole and how fast it's spinning, if I grabbed it and stopped it, I could get enough energy out of that black hole to unbind all the material in the galaxy. And that's what led to the doomsday black hole story in space.com. <laughs> okay. All right, so now I'm gonna tell you about uh, our first journal cover. Okay, and that's actually our first and only journal cover. Uh, it was the Sonoda, Sedona Journal of Emergence. Okay, and my postdoc was there's a famous bookstore in Pasadena called Roman's Bookstore, and astrology is right next to astronomy because the magazines are all in alphabetical order. And so this is actually one of our first press releases of a very famous remnant of an exploded star called Cassiopeia A. If you can't read this red uh, text here, it says, this new view of the historical supernova remnant Cassiopeia A, located 11,000 light years away, was taken by NASA. Inside, Cassiopeia speaks through Robert Shapiro. <laughs> now, I don't actually know what Cassiopeia A said because I didn't read the article. But um, anyway, we did make, we might have got more readers than the Astronomical Journal for that one. But with new stars, so now let me tell you about what we've learned about the explosions of massive stars with new star. And let me step back just a minute and um, remind you that the universe started as a soup of hydrogen and helium 
that existed and a little bit of lithium that existed shortly after it was born. And today, 13.8 billion years later, we uh, have a hot, um, after this hot homogeneous universe was created, we have a rich mix of chemical elements from nitrogen in the atmosphere to calcium in your bones. But what you're seeing here is a theoretical simulation of uh, filaments of hydrogen and helium shaped by the gravity of dark matter, all right, forming galaxies in the dense regions. And in these galaxies, stars form, and the massive stars burn through their fuel and they explode. Uh, these stars are creating elements uh, and spewing, spewing them out into galaxies. Uh, in the region between galaxies uh, when they explode. And this is how the elements, or many of the elements, uh, are forged and then distributed uh, in the universe so that uh, they can create, condense into galaxies, stars, planets, and life. So this, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful simulation, and it's based on governing principles, what scientists think is reasonable, but many of the key components still have to be verified uh, observationally. How it all works in practice uh, is still, uh, there's still an awful lot of observational work uh, to do. And one part of this observational work is to understand how these massive stars actually explode. So this, these images show you that this process of massive stars exploding in a little more detail. So stars are basically big nuclear fusion reaction, reactions, like a hydrogen bomb, all right, but much more controlled. And with these controlled reactions, they burn uh, hydrogen and helium into carbon, oxygen, silicon, and eventually iron, all right, but after, you know, enough of the star burns to iron, you can't create more heat to keep the star from collapsing, all right, because it's a detail of nuclear physics, and once you get to iron, you can't create energy from fusion. So what happens is the, the core of the star basically collapses and bounces and explodes the star uh, apart in what's called a supernova uh, event, and then, uh, this sends a blast wave plowing out into the medium around the star, which heat is, heats this medium, and it glows in what's called a remnant for hundreds to thousands of years after uh, the explosions. So these stellar explosions have uh, already mentioned, uh, even though it's a small fraction of all stars, they're very important uh, for uh, creating the elements and life itself. But how stars actually explode has been a profound mystery. It turns out that it's really, really hard to make something that's imploding very fast explode and blow apart, all right? And stellar explosions have some similarities to atomic bombs. And similar to bombs, huge computational power and theoretical resources have gone into trying to understand them. And until recently, most computer explosion models couldn't actually make a star explode, especially if they tried to do it in a spherically symmetric way. And even today, to make stars explode, computer models have to add theoretical ingredients that still have to be verified observationally. So what you see here is an example of one of these computer codes, all right, that can make a star blow apart. And the way this happens is that uh, the computer code puts in instabilities, or essentially what we call sloshing of the core of the star, all right, which does work, adds energy, and helps make the star explode. But is this really what happens? Well, you need observations uh, to determine that. Uh, 
There are other ways to make stars explode. One of them is to have the star rotating rapidly, in which case it'll explode in a very different way instead of uh, sort of sloshing around, all right, it'll create this very elongated uh, type of explosion, which again works, but we want to try to understand maybe all of these kinds of things are happening for different stars. How do we determine observationally uh, what is making stars explode? So kind of like with the black holes, right, the supernova event itself, first it's, it's pretty short, okay, it doesn't, explodes pretty quickly, and we can't, we don't have telescopes with good enough resolution to actually watch, like the, this theoretical model I showed you, what's going on in the explosion. So how do we learn about supernova explosions? Well, we can, discover, we can study the light uh, that you see shortly after the explosion and how that evolves. That's what Alex here does, Filipenko here does. But another thing that you can do is you can hope to learn more about the explosion by studying what's left over afterwards. And so previous low energy X-ray observatories have taken pictures of the remnants of supernova explosions that happened, you know, these pictures are hundreds to thousands of years after the event. And you can see that. These are incredibly beautiful. I mean, just look at them. These are real images, okay? These are not theoretical models. I like to make the analogy that it's sort of like a crime scene investigator who looks at the shrapnel and other debris after a bomb explodes and tries to figure out how the explosion happened, all right? So astronomical telescopes try to piece together the workings of the bomb from images like this. And what low energy telescopes have been able to look at is the hot glow from the debris of the explosions, because it's hot and it's heating up the, the, the you know, blast wave is heating up material, all right? However, what they're seeing is the very outer layers, or if you like, the casing of the bomb, all right? They're not actually seeing the inner workings of the explosion uh, itself, all right? So what uh, New Star has done is add, sort of given a new CSI, a new analytical method, right? Okay, so it's providing us a completely new tool with which to look at uh, these remnants of exploded stars. It's seeing the radioactive shrapnel. Instead of the hot material, the radioactive shrapnel, which you see when one chemical element changes into another. So when titanium changes into calcium, this happens on a very short time scale, you know, on cosmic in a few hundred years, the radioactivity is gone. But if you can look at young remnants, what you can do is use this radioactive material to see the inner workings of the bomb, okay, as opposed to what, how the casing gets distributed, which depends on a lot of uh, things like the material into which the bomb is exploding. Right. So here are images of the historical supernova remnant Cassiopeia A. These two are made by low, in low energy x-rays by the Chandra X-ray Telescope. And if you try to use the shape, so we're trying to use the shape of the explosion to determine what happened. Here, this is kind of blobby, and relative, you know, the blobs are sort of symmetrically distributed, the way that sloshing model looked, okay? Whereas this one is elongated, like the rotating star model, and people have used these to argue somewhat more civilly than in the case of the black holes about whether this was a rotating star mechanism or a sloshing mechanism. But when you look at the radioactivity, you see the true uh, shape or nature of the material and its distribution that was in the explosion itself. And without going into more detail, the shape is very indicative of what happens uh, in this sloshing model. So when you put it all together, this is Cassiopeia A and its panchromatic glory here with the new star radioactivity and then the hot glowing embers from in green and, and red from Chandra. 
And I want to say science is a wonderful thing, okay? Because before launch, you know, we'd, we'd put a lot of work into designing New Star to be able to observe the, this radioactivity, okay? But I had a bunch of theorists tell me I was wasting my time because everybody knows that the, this radioactivity is going to be distributed exactly the way that uh, iron, glowing iron, is in the red, okay? But you can see there's really no, <laughs> I mean, I showed this, my daughter was, five at the time, and I said, Joanna, do these look the same? She said, are you kidding? <laughs> so, so it's a mystery. We don't really quite understand this, but um, something new to study. And I'll end just by saying that we launched in 2012. For two years, the science team controlled the mission and did these observations. Since then, we've been giving the community access to New Star, so anybody, you could write a proposal to use New Star to look at something. Uh, we're now, again, it's uh, 2019. We just got review, uh, renewed by NASA for another three years of observations, so I think there's a lot more of exciting stuff to come. Thank you. Two questions. Um, what is the horizon for New Star in terms of its propellant and being able to aim it? And the other is, have you or do you expect to discover any um, black holes with retrograde accretion disks? Those are both great questions. So first off, uh, New Star doesn't have any propellant. So it, it really has nothing that's expendable. The orbit will eventually decay. Now, it is a small mission, and so the big, expensive NASA missions have two of almost everything that's critical. We have one of almost everything that's critical, so something could break. Uh, but other than that, the orbit should last for another 10 or 15 years. Uh, and then the question about retrograde motion is a, is a really good one, and that, um, uh, so far, there are no observations that securely show uh, a material orbiting uh, in the opposite direction uh, as the uh, spin of the black hole. And we think, in part, the black hole spin can be acquired from the mat, you know, the direction that mat matter, you know, if it consistently orbits in the same direction and falls onto the black hole, that can make it you know, spin faster. So it'd be quite interesting if you saw, you know, if the disks switch direction over time just because of the way the matter is falling in. Uh, that would be quite interesting because it, uh, it would say something about, you know, on average whether black holes acquire spin or looking at it the other way, if you measure the spin of a lot of black holes, that tells you something about how the matter falls on over long time scales. So the way we aim it is we have uh, magnetic uh, torque bars. So you put a current through a bar that creates a magnetic field that twists against the Earth's magnetic field. So we don't actually have to use propellant. When observing a uh these events that, that happen over very short periods of time, hours, days, weeks, uh, it, uh, the, the synchronicity of, of observation of, at different wavelengths and even with uh, gravitational now and, and particle telescopes, uh, to what extent is that uh, a matter of mere logistics and arm twisting uh, among, among people who control telescopes with built on completely different uh, operational premises, and how much is science, and how much can we see in the future in terms of hybrid observatories? Yeah, that's actually a great question, because we learn so much. You know, imagine we have a very wide field optical telescope that can say, oh, something exploded over here. You get the most information if everybody can quickly look, right? And like you say, until, 
You know, I used to work in the field of gamma ray bursts. And I saw Josh Bloom here earlier. He did too, right? So he can tell you, right, over a beer, how hard it was to call somebody up and say, please, you know, something interesting is going on. Can we please look over here? But we, we're really now, because of LIGO and, and better wide field telescopes, we're in this era of what's called time domain, where there's a huge community effort to try to make these quick observations happen. Uh, because the scientific return is so great. And you mentioned the gravitational waves. This is huge, right? I mean, you may have heard of the single merging neutron stars where we detected everything from gamma rays all the way to radio. And we learned so much about how, you know, elements like the gold in your, you know, wedding ring, platinum are formed, about energetic processes. So we do live in this age where everybody is trying to make it easier. And so one thing New Star is doing in its old age is we're trying to become more agile. So we're working with the people up on the hill at Berkeley to be able to point more quickly and respond more quickly. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, why does New Star appear to be much longer than the um, telescopes that are used to look in infrared? Also a good question. All right, so now I get to talk about the hardware a little bit, um, which I could have given another entire lecture on. But so the way that X-rays reflect, all right, uh, so they don't, if you make a lens, um, you can't make an X-ray lens very efficiently because they only, when they go into material, they only bend a tiny little bit. So you have to reflect them, and they only reflect at incredibly small angles or glancing incidents. So it's kind of like skipping a rock off the surface of a pond, right? You can imagine it bouncing off the surface, and then, you know, it comes to a, a focus very far away. And so you need to have a very long distance between these reflecting surfaces and the detectors. So it's just inherently the way x-rays reflect the physics of how they reflect off of materials. Is there a next generation, and how will it be improve upon uh, the characteristics? Well, you know, probably not surprisingly, astronomers are never satisfied. And we are thinking about a next generation uh, version that would have better. So New Star, I told you it made images that are, you know, hundreds of times crisper, better resolution. But it's still compared to what you can do in, in the optical or with even with the Chandra Low Energy X-ray Telescope. You know, we can still improve on that by factors of many. So we're thinking about how to do that, and if we could make a larger telescope launched on a bigger platform, but that's years away. Um, you know, I think we've got to develop the technologies and then convince NASA to do it. Did, was that the end of your question, or did you have another part? Yeah, so the, te the technologies really are based on um, being able to build mirrors that are much more precise. Um, I had a hardware question. When, when I saw those four devices that uh, made up the detector, mm -hmm. um, I, I was wondering um, what it is that can stop, you know, uh, 79 um, uh, kilo electron volt um, photon. So, is it are those area photon counters kind yeah, of so detectors? Is that sort of what it's how it's yeah, doing so the imaging? Right, so they work kind of similar to the what what are called the CCDs, you know, in your uh, or dete silicon detectors in your uh, so the cell phone camera. But you have to make the material uh, much uh, better at stopping high energy X rays. So we actually make the material. It's called cadmium zinc telluride. Okay. All right, but it's a kind of material that's very dense and very able to stop high energy x-rays. So we have to manufacture the detector out of that, and then the part that reads it out is made out of the silicon. And there's four of them in the 
detector just because there's a, a limit on the fabrication process on how you can make, how big you can make one detector. So we just put four in an array to get the size that we want. Can you uh, talk about the decision to point New Star at the sun and how you're able to handle that dynamic range? Don't get me going on this, okay? So New Star has been incredibly reliable, all right? The only two anomalies that we've had is when we tried to point at the sun. And uh, so the reason, why would you ever point at the sun? You know, the sun's a bright source of x-rays. New Star was built to be very sensitive. Well. It turns out that there's a big mystery, which is the corona of the sun is very hot, the photosphere is colder, and so how do you heat, you know, the corona is this hot, tenuous plasma that further out, how do you heat that? And one idea is that you have tiny, tiny little flares, you know, uh, called nanoflares, uh, going off all over the place, injecting energy in a uniform way. And so New Star is uniquely able to look, to, to find these. So after the primary mission, after we got the, submitted our report and got the letter from NASA headquarters saying, you officially accomplished all your primary goals, you're a success. So well, why not try to point it at the sun? There's nothing technically. <laughs> That stops us from doing it, and there's nothing else, you know, that existing or planned that can do this. So, uh, you know, that's why we did it for the science. But it turns out, and this is a kind of a techno nerd story, but I'll tell it anyway. It turns out that the coordinate system that we use to point New Star has a singularity in the equations at the sun the position of the sun, because who would ever want to point a telescope at the sun, right? And so the first time we tried to point, we were like, oops. And so then we kind of found a way around that. But uh, we now can point at the sun, but it was a learning experience. I will say the other thing, by the way, which I find fascinating is we can actually test theories of light dark matter, low, low mass dark matter by looking at the sun because there's an effect where the sun's magnetic field can turn these dark matter particles into x-rays. And if you see a, a glow of x-rays uh, in the right energy range from the sun, you can actually detect dark matter, which I, I also find fascinating. That's not why we did it, because I thought that was such a long shot, but it's kind of interesting. I was wondering what the field of view of New Star is, and as a follow-up, if it can be used to do like a general survey of the entire uh, celestial sphere. Yeah, so the field of view is, is pretty narrow. It's 12 minutes of arc on a side, which means it's really not very good for surveying large regions of the sky. You know, we've sort of surveyed a, maybe a degree, regions a degree on a side, uh, sort of laboriously. Um, so it's not designed. There are ways to design X-ray telescopes to have a wider field of view, but it makes them less sensitive. So we have to wrap up now, but please join me in thanking Fiona for a wonderful talk. <laughs> <laughs>